Good evening. My name is Gabriela Farrell, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. When we held Clark Forum events in person and on campus, we took a moment to acknowledge that the land on which we gathered belonged to indigenous peoples for centuries prior to European settlement. Currently, I'm inhabiting the ancestral land of the Lenape, the Susquehannock, the Conestoga, the Haudenosaunee, the Shawnee, the Erie, and later the Indian children of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. I encourage everyone watching this evening's program to take a moment after our presentation to acknowledge the tribes whose traditional land you currently inhabit. On behalf of Dickinson College, the Clark Forum, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and the Women's and Gender Resource Center, I am pleased to welcome you to tonight's event, Intersections of Race and Gender and Contemporary Iberian Studies. In Spain, as in other parts of the world, migrant women are often confront a range of challenges. The interlocking oppressions of racism, sexism, xenophobia, and classism often manifest themselves as negative social attitudes, institutional discrimination, and legal frameworks that fail to protect migrant women's rights. Although migrant women are vital for Spain's quotidian operations, they lack accurate political and social representation. Despite having a diversity of experiences, when migrant women are represented in areas such as Spanish film and literature, the role is limited to domestic functions and intimate work. Until migrant women and their experiences are fully represented and represented accurately in Spain, their oppression will continue. Both my grandmother and mother have shared with me their stories about confronting harmful representations and stereotypes as Korean immigrant women in the United States. The rise in anti-Asian xenophobia emphasizes the danger of false and limited representations of migrant women. The recent shooting in Atlanta was an act of racially motivated sexual vi violence against Asian women who have long been perceived in this country as meek and submissive and an object of, men's, of men's sexual desires. I also found this issue while conducting research for my senior honors thesis project. In this project, I learned that Bolivian migrant women in Argentina also face racist, sexist, and xenophobic stereotypes that attempt to justify their continued oppression. From both my personal and academic life, I've learned that the representations of migrant women deeply impacts their treatment in law and society and must be understood and transformed. For these reasons, I'm so excited to have Professor Michelle Murray with us today to reflect upon the established frameworks for representing race and gender in contemporary Spain and how they impact migrant women. Michelle Murray is assistant professor of Spanish at Vanderbilt University. Her research and teaching focus on contemporary Spanish literature and film. And her first book, Home Away From Home, Immigrant Narratives, Domesticity and Coloniality in Contemporary Spanish Culture, analyzes representations of immigrant women as domestic workers in contemporary Spain. She has published articles in numerous journals, including Research in African Literatures, Symposium, Letras Femeninas, Studies in Spanish and Latin American Cinemas, and Crossings, Journal of Migration and Culture. She is currently working on a book entitled Migrant Markets, which explores migration, political economy, and trafficking in, southern, in the Southern Mediterranean. There will be a question and answer session immediately following the program, so please type your questions into the live chat next to this YouTube video at any time. We now welcome Michelle Murray to begin her presentation. Thank you so much. Um, before um, I get started, I'm gonna to try to share my screen. Um, I, yes, I would like to thank um, everyone at Dickinson College and the Clark Forum, especially Mark Aldrich, um, Sarah Markowitz and Gabriella Farrell, with whom I've been in contact along with professors Copeland and Sosa for um, this invitation to share some of my work. Um, and I'm very excited to be here and just thank you. Um, so I'm just going to begin um, with my talk, which is Intersections of Race and Gender in Contemporary Iberian Studies. In the last three decades, Spain has experienced an unprecedented reversal of migratory patterns. After being an exporter of economic immigrants for most of the 20th century, Spain has been transformed into a destination for immigrants. This transformation took place as Spain's strong economic development after joining the European Economic Community in 1986 resulted in an increased demand for labor. My talk today discusses representations of 
migrant women, immigrant women in, from Spanish in, from films by Spanish directors to literary works by the children of immigrants, the second generation that has begun to define and express itself through and against these past images. So um, here's a simple plan um, that I will begin with narratives about women of color in Spanish cinema from um, 1999 to 2010, and then I'll move into narratives created by women of color, um, specifically Gaspacho Dulce, which is Sweet and Sour um, Gaspacho by Quandro Wu, and Hija del Camino, or Daughter of the Pathways by Lucia Sue Mbomio Rubio. Um, and I'm deriving my talk today from um, some of my own research, uh, co-edited, uh, co-authored, excuse me, chapter in the edited volume, Theorizing the Ibero-American Atlantic, an essay about princesas and studies in Spanish and Latin American cinemas, which is um, uh, an Iberian and Latin American studies film journal, and from my first book, Home Away from Home. Okay. Um, so Kathleen Vernon and Jaime Marti Olivella analyze how in 1990s Spanish cinema, the gaze operates in transatlantic films concerned with Cuba and Cubans, in which Spain seems to attempt to recover through Cuba a lost part of itself, a quote, better and bygone Spain, end quote. In terms of Spain's reception and reaction to different groups of immigrants, several critics have observed how these dynamics are also marked by the legacies of colonialism. Like some of the films analyzed by Marti Olivella and Vernon, Narratives about current immigration to Spain often articulate their plot around an interracial and transnational romance. Daniela Flessler has analyzed how interracial romantic relationships between African, specifically Moroccan male immigrants and Spanish women usually end up in failure in contemporary Spanish cinema. In the effective politics and ranking of who is perceived as assimilable in contemporary Spanish society, Moroccan men figure unfavorably. In contrast, most Latin American females occupy a privileged role in these narratives. They are positively seen as highly assimilable through their roles as potential sexual partners, wives, and future mothers of Spanish children. A neo-colonial echo is undoubtedly at play in these films where assimilation is realized through sexual conquest. As Joe Labani shows in the case of Spanish missionary films of the 1940s and 50s, otherness is assimilated and incorporated through miscegenation in a scenario where the masculine always conquers the feminine. Similarly, in the contemporary contract, context, Einreich and Russell Hoschild identify the, quote, lure of the exotic, end quote, exemplified in women from the, quote, exotic orient, end quote, or hot-blooded tropics as figures currently resurrected and actively pursued by men in wealthy nations to sustain the sexual politics of a colonial past. So the first film I'm going to discuss today, which has been widely studied, is called Flores de Otro Mundo, which narrates the story of three women who arrive in a small Castilian town during a festival organized by its numerous bachelors to counter its declining population. This is actually based on a true story of um, a small Spanish town that tried to import women to um, route to population. Flores de Otro Mundo posits Latin American female immigrants as the solution for solving the rural depopulation crisis in Spain. The characters embark on the great adventure of starting and having a family by participating in the caravan of women who hope to find a husband in the fictional rural town of Santa Eulalia. The central protagonist is Patricia, a mother of, a mother of two from the Dominican Republic who will marry Dam Damian, a shy and reticent farmer. And she's the, the um, larger picture here. As observed by Isolina Ballesteros, domesticity defines her daily routine as the central divergencies between Patricia and her mother-in-law usually occur in the domestic sphere with regard to cooking and other household matters. Patricia's patience with Gregoria, her mother-in-law, despite the latter's insults, is one example of her kind and respectable demeanor. Patricia befriends Miladi, who's seen in the lower corner, um, a 20-year-old hypersexualized Black Cuban brought to Santo Lalia by her middle-aged boyfriend, Carmelo. Patricia worries about Miladi and advises her to abandon her wild ways, which indicate that she is a woman without responsibilities and to settle down with Carmelo, who is secure and wants to marry her. When Miladi tells Patricia she, must, she first wants to see if she really likes Spain before deciding to settle down, Patricia describes the hardship and difficulty she faced as an undocumented migrant in Madrid and recommends that Miladi make security her top priority. Patricia's prioritizing of her children extends to her relationship with Damian. She marries him because he is secure and dependable. He is the type of man that will allow her to ensure a better life for her two children. During one scene, she admits she did not marry Damian for love. She defiantly tells him, do you think I would have married you if I could have had a house, a job, and my children? Thus, in the sole moment where Patricia could be construed as acting in self-interest to a certain degree, the love of, abnegate, the love of an abnegated mother prevails. 
Together with the idealized motherhood paradigm, Flores de Otro Mundo, like other films of the 90s and early aughts, are imbued with remnants of a colonial imagination that sexualizes other women for Spanish men's consumption and the centuries old pornotropics tradition of African and American women's sexual availability and access, as Luis Martin Cabrera observes in his essay about Flores de Otro Mundo, which I'll often abbreviate to Flores. Um, in this tradition, race plays a crucial role as black female bodies are especially targeted as the site of sexual deviance and excess. Spain's fixation with its colonial past, coupled with the persistence of the pornotropics tradition is evident in the absolute protagonism of the Caribbean and immigration films that are supposedly reflecting the realities of current Latin American immigration. Immigrants from the Caribbean, in fact, comprise a very small percentage of Latin Americans in Spain. The privileging of Cuba, especially, seem to obey nostalgically driven neo-colonial erotic frustrations and fantasies. In Flores de Otro Mundo, the two Caribbean protagonists, Patricia and Melati, share certain characteristics but are presented as being ultimately very different and thus encountering extremely different destinies in the film. The height of non-maternal sexualization occurs in the figure of black Cuban Melati who is brought to Santa Eulalia by Carmelo as his erotic trophy. Melati seeks excitement and adventure which are lacking both in her relationship with Carmelo and in the quiet, sleepy town. She provokes sexual admiration and excitement in every man who crosses her path and is bored by what Carmelo can offer. Their sexual relationship is filled with neocolonial implications, as has been noted by several critics. While Carmelo tries to domesticate her by making her stay inside the house and suggesting that having children will solve her loneliness, Mulati ultimately rejects him and abandons the town. In contrast, Patricia, the lighter-skinned Dominican mother, negotiates motherhood and domesticity with the right dose of sexual availability. Nothing excessive like Melati's, but enough to entice Damian to have fun in bed. She must, however, pass the test of whether she has enough moral virtue. When Patricia admits that she married Damian without loving him, he accuses her of being a prostitute. Despite the time she has spent being an exemplary wife, her control of her sexuality is brought into question. Ultimately, however, her maternal commitment to the family and true love for Damian will triumph, and she becomes an example of integration through assimilation. As several critics have noted, the way this assimilation is presented actualizes a colonial logic through the emphasis on Catholicism, privileging Patricia's daughter's first communion as a pivotal event and the naturalization of Spanish cultural practices. As Yun Soo Kim also observes, the film's quote, ultimate rationale remains unity and cohesion founded on similarities of religion, language, and traditional gender roles, end quote. Indeed, Patricia becomes the heroine of the film because she saves a disappearing way of life. It is the immigrant woman who facilitates the revival of this traditional Spanish household. Um, the next film that I'm going to move into is Princesas, um, directed by Fernando Leon de Aranoa. It presents the, re the relationship or friendship that develops between two prostitutes, Sulema or Sule and Cayetana or Calle. Um, Sule is a Dominican immigrant and Calle is a Spaniard. Um, Sule has relocated to Madrid to earn money for her son um, and prostitution is the only work she can find while Calle is working in prostitution to earn money for a breast augmentation procedure. By focusing on the question of the cinematic gaze um, in the essay that I wrote about Princesas, I argue that Princesas not only explores immigration in 21st century Spain, but also attempts to reformulate the way the audience visualizes immigration by presenting the chief protagonists in their invisibility, along with the attendant vulnerability this invisibility engenders, as other characters evade, objectify, or silence them. The spectator, therefore, does not just view the body of an other as it is fragmented, exoticized, or abused, but the shocking ramifications of otherness. The filmic apparatus that demarcates the audience's visual field continually forces the spectator to comprehend invisibility. The symbolic, formal dimension of the film complements its plot in which Zule suffers tremendously owing to her undocumented, illegal status. The film excavates the symbolic and material sites of violence that generate otherness. The friendship that forms between Kaye and Zule is predicated on Kaye's looking beyond the otherness ascribed to immigrants. The film invites the viewer to join Kaye and to assume a new viewpoint on otherness in Spain. While this cultural awakening is rooted in identifying with the white Spaniard who once derided Zule, it nonetheless constitutes a shift in collective approximations toward difference. Leon acknowledges that invisibility is an essential element of both prostitution and immigration. Referring to the immigrant prostitutes who inspired Princesas, he states, sorry, um, invisible, quote, invisible women do not exist. 
they don't work in the Casa de Campo Park every night, which is where the um, women walk the street, the Casa de Campo Park. You can, you can see them, but in re reality, they are not there. They don't have papers, which give them an identity and a life, the right to walk down the street. Their work doesn't exist either, although they pay daily taxes of precariousness and fees of persecution and pain, tripled because they are women, illegals, and putas in the original Spanish. Invisible women don't have a voice, end quote. Chad Montori provides insight into the Spanish sociopolitical milieu that causes these circumstances, stating that when parliament passed the foreigner's law, um, prostitution was redefined as no trabajo or not actual work. So immigrant prostitutes were unable to obtain the necessary documents to remain in the country legally. The criminalization of sex work has inevitably pushed many of these women underground where their voices and their stories are silenced. Owing to their non-work as prostitutes and their non-status as undocumented immigrants, the legitimizing state structures that would define these women as citizens, subjects, persons, instead render them invisible. Looking at invisibility in princesas paradoxically defies legal and social structures that op operate to marginalize undocumented immigrants and prostitutes. Films can mimic and reify social divisions in focusing the camera and the audience's gaze on certain characters and in and attributing stereotypical roles to the characters based on gender, race, or ethnicity. One could argue that Princesas reproduces the gender asymmetry intrinsic to patterns of looking in continually presenting attractive, barely clothed sex workers, both national and foreign, that the other characters in the film and the audience consume. The hypervisibility integral both to prostitution and to the structure of the film is vital to the way the film connects seemingly innocuous patterns of looking with danger and violence. The film's approach to otherness is consequently twofold. First, the film ventures to reveal the ways in which the undocumented status of some immigrants results in their denigration. Princesses analogously inter interrogates the violent histories of colonization and domination between Spain and Latin America that sustain the plot and make Calle and Sule's friendship possible. Indeed, Spain becomes undone, unbound both geographically and temporally through today's migration, which generates a reconsideration of the nation's colonial past. Thus, Princesas does not merely serve as a transnational cultural production that reflects current migratory patterns. The film also dares to propose that although cultural activity may originate with violence and conquest, another ending founded on solidarity is possible. Princesas begins with scenes that draw the viewer's gaze towards Calle's commodified body. We first view Calle engaged in a sexual transaction in a hospital surrounded by adolescents. She's a birthday gift for a boy in a cast. Soon after, Kaye is half naked, counting money she is saving for her breast augmentation procedure. She looks at pictures of breasts, placing her head shot on these partial bodies to imagine what she could look like after the surgery. In these initial scenes, physical embodiment, money, and sex coalesce to establish Kaye's profession as a prostitute, as a central dimension of her character. Zule's entry into the film, in contrast, is predicated upon her non-presence, horror, and silence. Kaye arrives late to an appointment and her client has replaced her with Zule. Kaye screams in the cafe, informing Zule that she is no longer in the jungle and she ought to act accordingly. The Dominican remains silent, compelling the enraged Spaniard to shout, no sabes hablar o qué? Don't you know how to talk? That's what it is in English. Zule leaves with Kaye's client and Zule's shirt emblazoned with the text, sex the girl 69, consumes Kaye's field of vision. Sule is not only silenced, but also fragmented, metonymically represented through this piece of clothing that underscores her sexiness and helps her to advertise her services to the Spanish public. This is not the first time that Kaya has seen this shirt. At the beginning of the film, she noticed it hanging on a clothesline in her apartment building and an eerie low angle shot reminiscent of the horror genre. The haunting presence assumes a form and a body through the immigrant stranger Kaya confronts in the cafe. After this encounter, Kaya, still infuriated that her client refused to compensate her for her cab fare, there's an unexpected knock at the door. Someone has left her 10 euros. She returns to her apartment and confirms that the sexy girl shirt is no longer outside on the clothesline. These scenes following the argument in the cafe efface the immigrant character and her presence is transformed into traces captured in the empty clothesline um, in the empty hallway where the money was left. Sule remains unseen. Her person becomes eclipsed by the haunting sexy girl shirt and the money earned from sex work. Further, the usage of the low angle shot off-screen sound disassociated from presence, which is the anonymous knocking, and dark shadows in the dimly lit hallway subtly suffuse these scenes with elements characteristic of horror. The usage of horror transmits to the viewer the frightful otherness that is lurking right within Kaye's home space in her apartment building. This threatening otherness lessens and eventually disappears once her relationship with Sule begins. 
Kaye and Sule's second meeting is equally tense and rooted in horror and silence. Kaye hears loud, vibrant Caribbean music while in her apartment. She ventures upstairs, guessing that Zule's home is the source. In the apartment, Kaye turns off the music and the mise-en-scene again faintly invokes horror. While the Caribbean music that both Kaye and the viewer heard no longer plays, extra diegetic sound creeps into the scene in a somber instrumental. The viewer assumes Kaye's point of view and sees broken dishes and silverware strewn across the floor. Kaye slowly continues into the apartment, creating suspense. Her gaze eventually leads to a naked, bruised, and bloody Zule, the central figure of the frightful scene the Spaniard observes. This moment not only signals a decisive shift in the plot, but also manifests the politics of looking that undergird princesas. Earlier, Kaye's half-naked body surrounded by money was the object of the viewer's gaze. Now, Kaye, whose perspective the viewer shares, transforms into the subject who looks at the immigrant body, marked by explicitly sexual victimization and violence. Kaye takes Zule to the hospital where the Dominican woman speaks her first words in the film, no tengo papeles, I don't have papers. This phrase explains her precarious existence in Madrid. She is an undocumented immigrant working as a prostitute to provide for her son in Santo Domingo. Her lack of papers explains the violence she has endured in silence. Zule fears the hospital might charge her for the treatment she receives and the viewer infers that she has little money. Another reference to her lack of papeles or national documents that could mitigate her grueling existence in Spain. Following this scene in which Kai's subjectivity is established and Zule acknowledges and internalizes her deficient national status, their friendship begins. Kai and Zule shop together and Zule selects provocative clothing for Kai to purchase. Zule also teaches Kai sexy phrases to say to her clients. In addition, Kai begins to wear Zule's sexy girl shirt proudly through the streets of Madrid. You can see that in um, the image on the right. These moments mark a shift in cultural patterns as it is Kaye who tries to become more like Zule. Yet this reversal is also duplicitous as it remains linked to Zule's hypersexuality and her ability to instruct Kaye in sexiness. This potentially groundbreaking inversion of cultural paradigms therefore operates as a veiled allusion to stereotypes about exoticized and sexualized otherness. As the friendship between Kaye and Zule blossoms, their conversations make the viewer painfully aware of each woman's sadness and desperation. Cristina Sanchez Cornejero contends that both women are hooking for Spanishness, using sex to attain nationalistic currency they lack. Sule desires citizenship, while Calle seeks an ambiguous nostalgia, a longing for a unified and cohesive home. Unable to cope with her husband's death, Calle's mother fabricates stories in which she is possibly ill, still living, and sends her flowers and candy she speculates might be gifts from her deceased husband. Both Calle and Sule have desires perhaps impossible to fulfill, only worsened by their work in prostitution, which secures and perpetuates their marginalization. One night, Zule insists, hoy no somos putas, somos princesas. Tonight, we're not prostitutes, we're princesses. The viewer now encounters two women who are pure and quasi-virginal, if only in the eyes of the director, in a characterization that ruptures the puta virgen binary. These moments in the film ultimately lead to destabilizations of reductive conceptualizations of both self and other. And this essay continues um, for a lot longer and I'm going to sort of wrap that part up, analyzing looking. So we see in these images on the screen, um, Kai and Sule looking at one another, Kai looking at um, her boyfriend in a restaurant. Um, but throughout the essay, I focus on particular forms of looking with regard to race, gender and hypersexuality and the medical gaze. Sule will be seen in a hospital, much like Kai was seen as in the hospital at the onset of the film, but Sule is repeatedly going to the hospital for the attack she endures and for the suffering and abuse that she um, experiences in Spain. Um, we see Sule um, bloody on a train and other places, um, and she finally goes to the hospital where they determine that she is HIV positive and she decides that she will return home to the Dominican Republic to live out the rest of her life with her family. And these forms of looking in terms of race, gender, and the medical gaze are all bound up with um, nationalism and the conceptualization of the nation and who belongs to the nation. And um, I show how in the article that these forms of looking um, force Spanish audiences to really see what is happening in Spain with the most vulnerable populations. Okay. The final film I'm going to discuss is also um, directed by Fernando Leon de Arenoa. Amador. Amador's opening sequence introduces the viewer to the symbols and images that will be developed during the rest of the film. It begins with a close-up of a lone flower visible in the harsh Castilian landscape of the Spanish capital. 
The flower is soon trampled by a group of immigrant men, including um, the protagonist, Marcella's boyfriend, Nelson. The flower remains despite the sudden thrashing. The men stake out a flower distribution center, waiting for the security guards to take a break. Once the guards have left, the immigrants scamper towards the company's dumper, dumpsters. They hurry to steal discarded flowers, but are spotted by the guards who cut up their coffee break short to protect the company's trash. The security guards detain one of the thieves. From a safe distance, the other immigrants demand that he release them, stating, he's your fellow countryman, es tu paisano. One of the security guards responds with insults. Ustedes son la vergüenza de mi país. You all are an embarrassment to my country. This scene, in using discarded fading flowers to raise questions about organic decomposition, migration, and marginalization, offers a glimpse into the tensions that will play out in the film. The flower is a prominent symbol in Amador. The flower expresses both fragility and strength as it survives the trampling. The wrecked flower also gestures towards the dynamics of gender that will play out in Amador. Marcella, as a partner to her boyfriend Nelson and as a caregiver to Amador, is immersed in gender expectations that harken back to problematic essential womanhood predicated on weakness and beauty. So the film, in case um, I think I cut that part out, is about a woman named Marcella who is a caregiver to an elderly man named Amador and whose um, boyfriend is Nelson. Marcella is much like the gentle flower presented during the initial scene, which provides a key image that will foreshadow the emotional highs and lows that she will endure in Amador. The focus of the film quickly shifts from the flower to Marcella. The viewer sees the first of many close-up shots of Marcella's facial expressions of anguish and confusion as she tries to make difficult decisions. She painfully crafts a goodbye letter to her boyfriend, Nelson. She packs her bags and waits for the bus that will take her to her new life elsewhere. She faints at the bus stop and soon after learns she's pregnant. Dejected, she returns home to tear up the letter and unpack her suitcases at the same time as Nelson returns from the dumpster debacle. In this scene, we learn that Nelson runs a small flower business out of their apartment. He and his coworkers steal discarded flowers, revitalize them, and sell them on the streets of Madrid. Pivotal to this business's success is a refrigerator where they store the flowers. Nelson plans to purchase a new fridge with the income Marcella gets from her job caring for the elderly Amador. Sadly, Amador dies before Marcella has completed a month of work, so she will not receive her full pay. She runs home to tell Nelson not to buy the fridge, but it is too late. He and a coworker are already celebrating in front of the gleaming new appliance. Marcella decides to lie to Amador's children and neighbors. She pretends that he is still alive so that she can at least earn one month's salary. So once Amador dies, this is a crucial part of the film, she just keeps pretending he's alive and pretending like she's care taking care of him so she can earn her money. Amador reveals a variety of issues afflicting immigrant communities. As the initial scene shows, undocumented and documented immigrants clash. In another scene, Nelson derides the African workers who sell flowers for him, noting that they try to cheat him and are, quote, acting like immigrants, end quote. With this assertion, he deflects the otherness commonly ascribed to immigrants from himself and projects it onto those whose racial, religious, and linguistic differences from the national population surpass his own. In the hierarchy of immigrants in Spain, poor African men often figure at the bottom owing to perceived racial, religious, and ethnic differences. Latinas, in contrast, are viewed as the most desirable immigrant group because of cultural similarities resulting from colonization. Yet these celebrated similarities conjure up the colonial matrix of power that instituted and perpetuated these connections and continues to inform globalization and migratory processes today. Moreover, this privilege, this privilege funnels them into domestic work and scenarios that often consign them to liminal positions and limits their full inclusion in Spanish society, as we saw in my discussion of princesas. Coloniality and attendant effective linkages to colonies facilitate the migration of Latin American women to Spain. Despite this purported openness to Latinas, evidenced in legal enactments and social structures, their inclusion is peripheral, frequently requiring them to embody atavistic forms of womanhood that embrace and celebrate a bygone domesticity predicated upon the marginalization and exploitation of women's work, as we saw in Flores de Otro Mundo, where Malati was inassimilable, while Patricia, who was willing to embody certain forms of womanhood, was allowed into the town. While, uh, as mentioned, Marcella planned to abandon her boyfriend, but the baby and the refrigerator connect her to him for longer than she had hoped. Likewise, Amador has essentially been abandoned by his daughter Yolanda, who is building a new home in the Madrid suburbs and has little time for her father, leaving him in Marcella's care. When she hires Marcella, Yolanda states, he just needs a little bit of help, that's all, someone to keep him company. Yolanda admits that what Amador needs most is company, that he is not constantly alone. As the viewer soon sees, the only two people who visit Amador are women paid to do care work, 
Marcela, and Puri, an older Spanish prostitute. There's tremendous physical and emotional distance between Amador and his family, much like the emotional distance between Marcela and Nelson. While Marcela's isolated state is related to her immigrant status, Amador's lack of family support suggests the breakdown of family bonds among Spanish nationals. Unlike Nelson, boyfriend, Amador can see and sense that Marcela is pregnant, evincing his connection to this migrant woman who ought to be a stranger. Gently placing his hand on her belly, he begins a conversation with the unborn child. There's no room for anyone here, but I'm leaving soon and you can have my place. Your mom will hold it for you. It is yours, remember that. Don't let anyone take it from you. The viewer sees Amador connected to Marcela's baby rather than the children in his own family. He even concedes his space in Spain to the baby, leaving him an inheritance of sorts despite their lack of genetic ties. The viewer is initially heartened by the touching relationship between Amador and Marcela and hopes that they will mutually benefit from their time together. When Amador dies, the viewer is disappointed not only because of the financial implications, but also the emotional ones, as both Amador and Marcela have finally found a person with whom to talk and share their feelings. The relationship between Amador and Marcela also subverts the ideological pillars of nationalism, racism, and xenophobia. xenophobia. They relate better to one another than to those with whom they have more superficially in common. Even Nelson, Marcela's boyfriend, and Yolanda, Amador's child, who formed part of their national and individualized families. The form and mise-en-scene of the film function to intensify the loneliness and marginalization of Amador and Marcela. The dated decor in Amador's apartment suggests a bygone era and structural decay. Curry claims that Amador's selfish children have not even bothered to change the curtains, which are more than 20 years old. Amador's nostalgia for better and lost times in his coastal town, in his home with his family, plagues him as he remains in the bed, watching television, completing puzzles, and dreaming of recovering the impossible. The overall slow pace of the film gives the viewer a sense of the tremendous gravity of the problems that Marcella must resolve as she oscillates between a desire to inform Amador's family of his death and desire to make the best financial decisions for her unborn child. The abundance of close-up shots of Marcella's somber facial expressions as she travels to work alone, goes to the doctor alone, or sadly stares alone at the refrigerator that has sealed her fate, continually remind the viewer that she must settle these predicaments in solitude. One scene fuses the loneliness of the two protagonists. After Amador has died, a letter that he has written to a former lover is returned to his home and Marcella opens it. Reading, reading the letter deeply affects Marcella. Explaining why he is saying, I love you, Amador writes and Marcella slowly reads, quote, inside of me, these words have no value, but perhaps they will bloom in you, end quote. Uniting the two in body and speech, Amador's words flower in Marcella, who attains awareness of her crippling solitude and decides to remedy her situation. The reference to flowers and blooming here resonates with the film's opening image, images of flowers and their becoming symbols in Amador. Flowers begin the film Amador, and upon the title character's death, the flowers assume increased significance. To cover up the stench of the corpse, Marcella takes flowers from Nelson's business and places them throughout Amador's home. Much like Amador, the flowers have wilted and the company has discarded them, yet they are rejuvenated and repurposed by the immigrants who profit from what was erroneously considered dead. Amador's apartment becomes a massive funeral scene with the deceased title character covered with a sheet and surrounded by bouquets. Marcella is a solitary mourner who longs for the economic and emotional support Amador once provided. The flowers again signal the importance of life and death for the lonely protagonists. As Nelson states in the film, there are three important things in life, no more. Love, life, and death, and all three are celebrated with flowers. All three events converge in the figure of Marcella through the child she carries, the love she has for Amador, and his death. The solitary mishandled and brutalized flower at the beginning of the film comes to represent Marcella's struggles and her perseverance. Marcella's predicament becomes more acute when a nosy neighbor smells something rotting and intimates Amador's apartment is a source. In the psychoanalytic context, deaths remaining inside constitutes a threat to the construction of the self. According to the basics of Kristeva's theory of objection, what is dead must be expelled for the self to continue. On the contrary, in Amador, an immigrant woman embraces the death within for her own economic and psychological survival as she needs to earn her salary for the month and longs to have an interlocutor again. The film's portrayal of Marcella's maternal body could potentially intensify this paradigm as the mother's body is the point of departure for abject scenarios as every living being must separate from its mother to survive and Marcella's illegal status suggests the transgression of meticulously erected national borders. Yet it is the dead Spanish man's body that sets forth the scene of objection. 
The film suggests that the rotting body is that of the national who must be objected for the immigrant woman to maintain her bodily integrity, reversing the norms of objection. She covers the apartment in Nelson's flowers to conceal the odor, creating an eerie funeral scene that she attends daily. Their five flowers echo the movie's emphasis on life, death, and mourning. And these scenes drive the viewer to call into question the extent to which social reconstitution functions as a nationalist act. Indeed, the flowers rejuvenated by immigrant hands, a bygone Spain lays the groundwork for a more diverse society. Unsure of what to do, Marcela visits a church and to confess and consult with a priest. She admits to the priest that she cannot resolve a loved one's death. When she describes her dilemma, the priest comforts Marcella, telling her not to let go of Amador and to hold on to him and to accept him as her guardian. Predictably, Marcella is relieved. At this juncture, it appears that despite its lessened power in democratic Spain, the Catholic Church has licensed Marcella's unethical behavior. Here, the double meaning in the priest's words grants legitimacy to Marcella's handling of Amador's death. Later in the film, she meets with Yolanda, Amador's daughter, who has found out about what she is doing. Yolanda tells her that she is completely engrossed in building her new home and reveals that Amador was helping finance this endeavor with his pension. Without this money, Yolanda will not be able to finance the construction or fi finish her construction. Program. To that end, she asks Marcella to continue doing exactly what she has been doing, saying that she will handle the nosy neighbors. Yolanda expressly frames her request using domestic dynamics rather than emphasizing her own self-serving desires. She asks Marcella to keep accompanying Amador so that he is not alone, noting that otherwise homes deteriorate. This statement leads the viewer to consider the ways in which Yolanda has allowed Amador's home to deteriorate through her inaction. While the previous scene of objection involving Amador's dead body transmitted a generational desire for a new multicultural society, with this scene, the younger generation sanctions this conscious abjection. We thus witness national a national representative willing to expel an ostensibly native element to embrace a foreign one. Collapsing the deteriorating house and the corpse, the movie stages abject scenes through spaces and bodies Marcella encounters as she attempts to find a place for her son and herself in Madrid. For film theorist Tina Chanter, abject moments can put into crisis imaginaries by exposing their instability. The film undermines the visual mechanisms that frequently represent society and its attendant mutually constitutive scripts of race, gender, and class. Inverting the paradigm in which a maternal body is horrific, Amador transmits the, the destruction of, of the past as Spain sallies forth toward an unclear cosmopolitan future with diverse cultural elements. And so in the latter part of this talk, I'm gonna talk about these diverse cultural elements that Amador sort of leaves. Um, leaves us with in the end. Um, and perhaps the most striking element of Amador, just returning to that for a moment, is that Marcela suggests that she's going to name her son Amador after um, the, her Spanish um, friend and employer with whom she had that very intimate and special relationship. Um, and she also is going to leave Nelson, which shows that she's leaving part of her migrant past and embracing this part of the Spanish past. Okay. I have been crafting a trajectory of text treating migration, gender, and race in contemporary Spain. I do not believe this chronology is diachronic or moves from negative to fewer negative portrayals, as there are dozens of other works that are radical, radically nationalist, or something else, and prove that these tensions continually ebb and flow. I would like to end, albeit briefly, by pointing out the works of two Spanish women of color who are charting new terrain with regard to representations of gender and race. Juan Jo Wu's graphic novel, Gaspacho Agridulce, or Sweet and Sour Gaspacho, is the first example. Wu's graphic novel is rich in uniting image and text to chart out the development of the protagonist, Juan, the daughter of Chinese migrants in a small town in Andalusia. Rather than expressing the jarring experience of foreign arrival and difficult assimilation seen in Flores, De Otro Mundo, Princesas, and Amador, Wu's book focuses on the identity crisis the protagonist experiences as she tries to discover who she is in her Spanish settings. The allusion to food is also powerful. Maria Giulia Gracili states that superficial forms of cultural relativism, such as music and cuisine, tend to foment a facile interaction with the other that ritualizes ethnicity, commodifies culture, and undermines the politicization of ethnic groups on the grounds of their oppression and exclusion from dominant society. Such is not the case in Gaspacho Agridulce, where the Chinese restaurant the protagonist family owns constitutes a point of departure for understanding herself and operates as a hub of sorts from where she can always reside in the hybrid identity she attempts to explain as an Andaluchina, which combines Andalusa and China in a new formulation. 
Hybrid or impossible identities are also the focus of Hija del Camino or Daughter of the Past. Whereas the films discussed today all impress impossible identities onto the protagonists that belie their transnational or multinational identity status as migrants. This novel thrives in the complicated ambivalence of El Camino or the path. Sandra, the protagonist, is the daughter of a white Spanish woman and an Equato Guinean father. So her father's an Equatorial Guinean. And she grows up in Alcorcón, a neighborhood in South Madrid. Both novels are moving and showing the gripping effects of racism on the protagonist woman as children. For they grow up aware of a sense of difference, either because their parents desired that difference or classmates broached the subject, sometimes in an aggressive, violent fashion. So in Gaspacho Agridulce, um, her parents tried to maintain her Chinese identity. They try to maintain that difference, albeit, albeit in a very difficult way because they're in Spain. Going to Guinea does not root the protagonist of Hija del Camino either. There, Sandra is called a white woman and her heart breaks at her inability to assimilate into or even accept the unjust and misogynistic culture she encounters in Africa. A quote from Hija del Camino surmises the complex, entangled identities Wu and Mbamio embrace in their texts, a posture, with, a posture which differs enormously from the rigid nationalism and uncritical neocolonial logics that cultivate the violence and horror we saw in the earlier films. Sandra states, and I'm gonna read it in Spanish and the English translation is there. Por eso, los migrantes y sus hijos son eternos errantes, aunque no se muevan. Son el puente que une, la frontera que separa. Son corazón y son nem, que es espíritu, which is like spirit. Depende del momento, depende de los otros, y depende de ellos mismos. Ella ya no es Sandra ni es Nom. Es todo junto. Hasta sus nombres gritan su riqueza, su intersección y su diferencia. Narran el sendero que empezó antes de que ella naciera, Que está, que está lleno de trechos bellos y vías muertas. No queda otra que seguir la marcha. Nació en un camino y continúa en él. Um, and I'd like to just emphasize that last sentence. So even in English, there is no other choice but to continue the march. She was born on a path and continues on it. Um, so embracing the path is sort of this idea that there is a continual process and that the difficult identities impressed upon the woman that we saw, mother, prostitute, Dominican, Caribbean, Cuban, will have to be forsaken for this new idea of a path of what critical race theorist Sylvia Winter terms the hybridly and, com and complex human. And with that, I'm going to end um, my remarks for today. And I thank you um, for listening to my talk. Thank you so much, Professor Murray. So as promised, we're gonna start the Q&A session. So we have a few questions in the chat and just remember um, at any time, if you wanna add more questions, feel free. So I will start with the first one. Um, one viewer is asking, sorry, one viewer is asking um, if you think that the demographics of sex work in Spain, overwhelmingly immigrant women, is or has been a significant factor in successive governments' failure to move forward any meaningful legislation to change prostitution's longstanding illegalidad in Spain? Yes, and this is not just a Spanish characteristic. The statistics are really similar elsewhere in Europe, um, in Germany and France, um, not as high as in Spain, where I think it's like 90% or higher of the women who are sex workers are migrants, but they're, they're, it's definitely more than like 60% elsewhere in Europe. Um, another issue is that um, one of the largest um, brothels in Europe is on Spanish soil. It's called a French brothel on Spanish soil. It's called Paradise. And it's really just incredible, like unbelievable as in you cannot believe it. It's been the site of kidnappings, bombings, and the owner of Paradise has been arrested and convicted on trafficking women from the Americas and Africa to work in his building, in his, in his establishment. Um, so the government also generates a lot of money from this work. We know that the informal economy in Spain in which these women are immersed um, contributes 25% to the gross domestic products, which is extremely high. 25% of your economy is based in informal um, illegal activities. So yeah, I think that um, there is a lot of money to be made. It's a lucrative business and it's easy to exploit these people and that the government is not going to probably um, intervene for those reasons, neither in Spain nor in any country in Europe. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, do you see that within the pre 
preference, preference of Latinas in Spain's migrant class, there is a differential treatment based on nation or region of origin? So when um, Daniela Flesch and I published the essay that was about Flores, um, it was that um, Latin American immigrant women from the Caribbean were like less than 3% of the population, but they were always popping up in these films because it was this sort of, um, the sexualized image of the very sexy Cuban or Dominican woman um, who is there. Latin Americans were the largest immigrant group at one point. I'd have to check the statistics in light of the Great Recession because as um, economies in Latin America became more stable post-2008, Spain's economy crashed and lots of Latin Americans returned to places like Peru, Colombia, um, where you could find a job and whereas in Spain you could not. Um, but those dynamics um, of still that fascination with the Caribbean are definitely present despite what the demographics might say. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how do you think gender norms have evolved in Spanish films in the past several decades? That's a really beautiful question and really complicated. I think that um, it truly depends on whom you're talking about, right? Because immigrant women can be represented in a very um, sort of atavistic, um, stereotypical, old school, to use a <laughs> little word, um, fashion, whereas Spanish women um, are seen in an entirely different way. And this sort of reflects the political reality in which um, Spanish women you know, were liberated could go to work and assume more public presence, but that did not translate into women not doing housework, women not raising babies. It was just work that was then transferred to poor women. There were bilateral agreements that were enacted between Spain's former colonies. So Spain's government brought in women from the Dominican Republic and the Philippines to do this work like legally. Um, and so these were women who were allowed entry into Spain provided that they were willing to do work that Spanish women would not do. So you have um, a representation of Spanish women in a very, um, progressive and innovative way. Um, oftentimes, if you're looking at women who are European, and then if you're looking at representations of African women um, or women from the Middle East or Arab women or Latin American women, you see some different representational paradigms. Um, and it just, it, there's not, I, I don't like the idea of there's a chronology like in 1995, we stopped being racist and now we do this. Like it just comes and goes. There's a movie that's super powerful from the early nineties called, um, or from 1990 called Las Cartas de Alu, which gives an immigrant interiority. He speaks, he has thoughts, which is very rare in Flores de Otro Mundo. Only the white woman has thoughts. Um, you see her writing and thinking, whereas the women of color do not. Um, and then there's movies, um, you know, like, um, a Remarkable Tale, I forget what the translation is, it's on Netflix, um, which is really problematic. <laughs> it came out, you know, last year. Um, so, you know, it it just depends on the, on the director's vision. I think that Fernando Leon de Aranoa is extraordinary. He was out there, you know, protesting with the sex workers and working with them while he was creating Princesas. He really understood the issue from the perspective of um, sex workers collectives, which is why he was able to make these beautiful films like Princesas and Amador. Thank you. And kind of on along the lines of that question, do you see, like, I imagine, like, how you're saying based upon the director's vision, like, I guess that has to do with, like, what type of audience they're trying to reach. Do you see, like, the Spanish public sort of wanting something, I don't know, more accurate, more accurate representations? Or, I don't know, like how you're saying, like, it's not necessarily, not, not necessarily chronological, but I was just wondering, like, how you see the differences. I mean, I am not living in Spain or based out of Spain. So this is all, you know, the perspective of a person who just studies Spain a lot. But I will say that um, I think in 2015, the film Palmeras en la Nieve, Palm Trees in the Snow came out, which is about Spain's relationship with Guinea, Equatorial Guinea, its last colony in Africa, or not really, its last colony in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this movie um, was really, really, really problematic, right? Um, and it's loved by everyone. It's a movie about a man who goes to Equatorial Guinea, meets a woman, his brother rapes her, she has this baby, doesn't know whose it is. Um, he, you know, her, her African husband is killed so that they can be together and everyone's fine with it, right? This is one of the most, the highest grossing films um, in recent Spanish history. It's super popular. Um, it's supposedly a love story. And I was like, you know, I don't see it. <laughs> um, but this is sort of what people want. And then the, one of the film's producers said, this film is 100% Spanish when it's 
colonial film, right? That had to be filmed in Colombia and the Philippines because they couldn't even go to Equatorial Guinea because of you know what has happened there. So um, I think that when it comes to cultural difference, there's a desire to know. Um, the film Adu as well also just won a bunch of Goyas, which um, I haven't seen yet, but one of my um, activist friends who was a migrant to Spain actually went in like one of those little boats. He says that it is absolutely awful and that there's scenes of just brutal violence against African bodies that he doesn't understand why they had to be shown on film. Um, so it is navigating a difficult terrain of sort of showing that horror, but without dehumanizing people. And it's just really hard to do. I mean, I'm not a filmmaker either. I, doubt I could do it, but um, there's a desire to share these stories, but then how to share them becomes really complicated. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question the viewer is saying, Hija del Camino takes place in several different places, Madrid, London, France, Equatorial Guinea. And if you could talk a little bit about how her perception of her identity changes based upon these changes in location. Yes, so she begins as a child in Madrid. And what's powerful about Hija del Camino, which is something that Lucien Bomio always points out and is also a part of her first book, Las que atrevieron, um, her mom told her straight up, like, you are black and people are gonna call you black, you need to get prepared. Like her mom did not try to sugarcoat. Um, she knew what she was dealing with raising a, Irish, a multiracial child in um, 1980s Madrid. Um, and then she travels to France um, as part of like a high school exchange program sort of thing. And she starts to see black people um, and that changes her perception. And then she goes to Portugal where she's believed to be um, Cape Verdean because <laughs> there is that history and she has that look and she meets more and more black people. And so she begins to develop this consciousness. What's fascinating is that um, when she works as like a dependienta, um, like a sales girl in a store, she meets a Latino man who gives her um, Las Venas Abiertas de America Latina to read um, about colonial histories in Latin America. So she has that shared history with him as someone from Equatorial Guinea. And then when she goes to Guinea, as I stated um, briefly, she's, you know, called white and she's really sort of, there's some really difficult scenes to assimilate because it's much like what the theorist Sadia Hartman um, from the American context talks about when you try to return to Africa as this homeland and it's just not there. Um, and so I believe that she develops this idea of El Camino as a very powerful theoretical tool for understanding that Black people in the diaspora are on this sort of path and that you're always sort of um, moving towards this greater realization of what you are. And part of what I want to show in this talk today is that these voices themselves are the best to do that, right? Um, versus voices that are well, in, or creators who are well-intentioned who are trying to do a lot of things, um, but sort of narrating how you've come to your own consciousness about your identity is very powerful as we've seen, you know, with Roots and a million other books um, in identity-based context. So yes, those, all of those trajectories help her because um, as Lucia Rubio, Mbomio Rubio herself states, she didn't even talk to a black person or have a black friend until she was in her twenties because she's from Spain. Yet when she went to Portugal, they were like, oh, you talk like a Spanish person. She's like, I'm from Madrid, right? Like, I mean, it was just so hard for people also to recognize her as Spanish. And it's a very complicated and hybrid identity that she has to embody this entanglement of being someone who is in her, you know, and su modo de ser in her way of being very, very Spanish, but is also black. And having those two identities reside in the same body um, is an identity crisis for her, but also for people who view her continually, who think that, oh, she's Cape Verdean, oh, she's this, oh, she's that, where she is black Spanish, which is something that she's trying to articulate and establish through the narrative, through that writing, that path. Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, great novel. I highly recommend it to everyone. Yes, I really want to read it now. <laughs> um, the next question is, can you briefly describe the re reception of these films in Spain? Are they accepted and slash or appreciated or viewed as edgy and radical? Um, so Flores de Todo Mundo was, um, it's in Spain, I can't speak to as much in the American Academy. It's studied a lot and shown a lot in undergraduate classes. Um, my Spanish students who I have who are older doctoral students usually are less familiar with it because it's old now, it's from 1999. Princesas um, was big, it actually screened at Sundance. It was big on the indie circuits um, and it won a lot of Goya awards, which are like the Spanish Oscars or um, perhaps Oscars are the Spanish Goya, are the American Goyas we should say. Um, <laughs> but um, it, was, it was really, really popular. And 
Um, Fernando Leon de Aranoa tried to continue <laughs> with Amador, which was panned by critics and seen as very slow, very born very heavy. It's a very philosophical and um, like heavy film. Like you really feel the weight of all of those decisions that she's making. And you're just, you know, you feel the pressure constantly in the film and you as a viewer are pressured. So um, after Amador, um, he sort of abandoned those topics a little bit and tried to go back to some other things. Um, but Amador um, was, was not very well received at all by critics in Spain because it is a slow, heavy, um, just powerful, like it just tries to really hit you in ways that um, Princesses is like, to give a box analogy, like little jabs, or is it just like tries to just knock you out very slowly? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's Princesses was well received and Amador was not, and Flores in a nutshell is not really studied anymore because it's old and hard to find. Great, thank you. Um, so we have time for one last question. Um, the, the viewer is saying thank you for sharing your work and that they're struck by the emphasis on the maternal body or maternal, poten maternal potential in women's bodies in these films, even in Princesas. Um, and they are asking, sorry, do you see this as a conservative move or one, um, sorry, there's a few little comments. Um, then she says that Kaye's narrative Arch tilts towards maternity, giving up her money for her breast augmentation surgery. Um, and then Zuli's return home so that she might be with her son. And is the, the question is, do you see this as a conservative move or one that ultimately challenges the institution of, this, of the family in Spain? So um, that's a really beautiful question because um, the maternal is very important. So Spain and Italy had you know, um, policies that just pronatalist policies that advanced motherhood under um, their dictators um, before. And they're highly Catholic nations, which, you know, sort of embrace reproduction. So of the, let's say there's 195 nations on the United, in the United Nations list, Spain's birth rate was like 194, it was dangerously low. And so immigrant women in having babies were producing the people who would pay the social security of the future generation of Spaniards and they are needed. Um, the ending is really, really complicated because um, Kaye does give up all that money she's been saving for her breast augmentation procedure to send Zule back home. And Zule is going back home to be a mother to her son with HIV. And Kaye lets her mother answer her phone that she uses for her call girl work, which sort of insinuates that she's going to abandon prostitution. So you have two families that are reconstituted through this ending, even if they've been on a painful journey to do so. I would not say that it's um, conservative. I'd say that it's more radical because these are families that are going to acknowledge that history of pain that they've had to endure to be families, that Zule had to give up so much or tried to give up so much to give her son a better life and that Kaye was so broken as her mother was. Um, it's also very interesting that like there's this absent patriarch both in Princesas and in Flores de Tromundo. Um, in Flores de Tromundo, Gregoria, Patricia's mother-in-law, goes and puts flowers at her husband's grave. And this is where they have their big moment where they finally come together, where Patricia honors this dead patriarch, which could be a conservative thing, like sort of like this Francoist figure that's looming in the background. Um, I think that there's an endless amount of interpretations of that and that the directors, um, both Isier Boyain and Fernando Leon de Aranoa, leave them um, in, intentionally complicated um, so that viewers can meditate upon these topics, right? These aren't, you know, these aren't, you know, blockbusters, just like, whoa, did you see that? These are films that are supposed to make you think. And I think that all the directors achieve that in making you meditate upon like, what is migration? What are we doing here? What roles are these women fulfilling? What are they contributing to, this, to society and how does society accept or expel these women? So, um, Motherhood is a huge axis on which to think about how society accepts or expels women um, and how women can be a part of society and reproduce society through social reproduction, having and raising babies. Um, so yeah, I, I have no answer. Um, I think that it is radical, but I'm not exactly sure how. Well, yeah, I just said because of the pain the families had to endure to be families. It's not the, the sort of um, conservative, easy family narrative. Thank you. Thank you for that answer and for all the other ones. And also thank you to all our viewers who submitted questions. Um, that's all we have time for uh, for tonight, but I'm really excited to get to interview you tomorrow to ask a few more questions. But thank you again for your time and for such an interesting discussion about these pieces of literature and film. I really wanna now go watch all of them and really think about um, all the issues you brought up about gender and race and migration. 
Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your time and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thanks Have a great you. night. <laughs> Bye. Bye.